Good evening and welcome everybody to our IE talk this evening uh, entitled Is Hydrogen the Energy Vector for Net Zero? Uh, it's a question and you know, we'll, we'll learn about that in a minute. Um, coming back to tonight, um, we're very pleased to welcome Abigail Dombey here to speak to us tonight. Now, Abigail um, is an energy and sustainability engineer and also chair of Hydrogen Sussex with an extensive background in carbon reduction sectors and in the public sector. Currently, she focuses on decarbonisation projects and is leading on a DESNZ, which you'll remind us what that stands for in a minute. Uh, it's the Department of Energy Security Net Zero. Perfect. So, four new frames. Yeah. 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 But that also came up at our last lecture, but I've forgotten what it's <laughs> Abigail has reminded me. Um, and they're funded by the industrial fuel switching project working with hydrogen. So, um, Abigail, over to you. Brilliant, thank you. Um, I hope you all can hear me okay. Um, I'm really delighted to be invited to speak to you today um, about is hydrogen the energy vector for net zero? Uh, I was going to introduce myself, but it's but Greg's pretty much done it for me. I'm, um, I'm a chartered engineer and chartered environmentalist, neither of those are with um, IET, I, I um, confess. Um, I've been working in um, carbon reduction and decarbonisation my entire career and in hydrogen in the last few years. Um, so I've been chair of Hydrogen Sussex since it was formed, since its inception um, back in 2020. And um, I'm currently working on a hydrogen fuel switching project, uh, which I haven't actually mentioned in the presentation, but I'm happy to talk about afterwards. I was project managing, so I'm project managing a Desmond's funded project. Currently, um, we did a similar project, a hydrogen fuel switching project, a couple of years ago, which I can talk about as well, which this photo is from. Because um, it's never straightforward when you're working with hydrogen. Um, so, I always start off any hydrogen, well, virtually any hydrogen talk with a very, very quick hydrogen 101. Apologies to those in the room who know this already. Usually, if I give this talk on teams, I say this is the perfect opportunity for you to pop out and get a quick, have a, make some cup of tea. Um, I don't think that's possible here, but um, yeah, I, I tend to include this in all the talks apart from the one that I gave to the Institute of Mechanical Engineers because I thought they might uh, run it if I tried to. But, um, so hydrogen is an energy carrier, it's not a source of energy in itself. Um, you usually, you virtually always have to input energy to, to get hydrogen in the first place. So green hydrogen is produced from electrolysis using renewable energy. So you pass the electricity through water and it produces hydrogen and oxygen um, as a hydrogen you obviously safe, safely store for onward use. And the, th the important thing about hydrogen, the, the reason why it's become uh, the energy vector of the moment um, is because there's no carbon emissions on use, so neither on production of green hydrogen <coughs> or on its use. And its use could be in a fuel cell, um, which is a reverse process to electrolysis. You put hydrogen in it, reacts with the oxygen in the air, and it produces water and um, electricity and, and a bit of heat. Or you can simply fire hydrogen um, as a replacement for natural gas, which um, which we've done. So um, um, when you when you fire hydrogen, you don't get any CO2 emissions. You do get NOx emissions, but there are no um, and the reason why there's been so much focus on hydrogen is it's got very incredibly high energy density per unit weight. So it's really useful as an energy carrier per unit weight. So you can store, it says 40 kilowatts, it's a bit more like 33, 35 kilowatt hours per kilo of hydrogen. Quite large kilo of hydrogen, unless it's compressed to a very high pressure, 300 bar, or 500 bar, or 700 bar. So a lot of energy has to go in there to compress it, but it's very light. And the equivalent is you get 13 kilowatt hour per kilo of diesel, 
and this slide says you'll get uh, 50 watts watt hours per kilo of battery. So it's a great energy carrier. And it's got a myriad of uses which I will go on and talk about. So you can this suggest that you could use it for, for fuel cells, for residential use, for commercial use, you can use it in industrial processes and transport fertilizers, um, and then there's different ways to, for, to produce hydrogen, um, and you'll see here that the slide has different coloured arrows, and the arrows represent the different forms of hydrogen you get. So this, this is really the, the hydrogen 101 hole in the floor here which I keep trying to fall down. So there's different types of hydrogen. So brown hydrogen is, is a producer of byproduct from industrial processes. With, it's got a high carbon footprint. Grey hydrogen similarly also has a high carbon footprint and it's produced using fossil fuels without any carbon capture. Blue hydrogen is also produced using fossil fuels but there is some carbon capture although you'll never capture all the carbon that's given off. So you'll never catch all the CO2, there will always be a carbon footprint of to blue hydrogen, it will never be zero carbon. And then green, green hydrogen, as I mentioned, is produced using electrolysis powered by renewable electricity or by nuclear, and that can be zero carbon. Oh, excellent, almost switched myself off there. So I'm going to go on and mention this in, the, in this talk and talk about the different potential uses. So there's, there's, a, there's many potential uses in, in power and in industry, so in um, steel manufacturing, in the many places where hydrogen is currently used in industry, in um, uh, oil distilleries um, and the like. And so, you know, there's, there's lots of potential users in, in industry um, and potential users in, in transport. I just got an email today about the launch of um, the hydrogen aviation uh, new policy that's coming out, or new strategy that's coming out in, uh, next month. Um, so there's, there's potential uses in, in, in aviation, in heavy goods vehicles, in the maritime sector. It's, it is the energy vector of the moment. Um, and there's also, this isn't quite so sexy, but it's really, really important to potential uses in fertiliser from green ammonia. Green ammonia produced from green hydrogen. Um, and this is a, a really important use. And people also talk about decarbonising electricity. And I'll go on and mention this later in, in my talk. I am aware <coughs> that I'm not the ex electricity expert. You guys probably are. So I'm going to talk about that to some extent, but I'm aware of the, the increased knowledge of my audience. Um, so there's, but there's potential in use in, or vital use in detail <coughs> electricity. Um, in the UK, there's been a lot of focus on hydrogen for domestic heating, and there's been lots of talk about hydrogen for domestic heating. Um, there was a, uh, a number of hydrogen hubs that have set up where they were planning some village trials in, in Whitby, in, um, in the northwest, Whitby and Ellesmere Port in the northwest in Cheshire, and um, in Redcar in the northeast, and also plans for a hydrogen trial in, um, in Fife in Scotland. And, um, so there's been lots of focus on that and a lot of lobbying about hydrogen and domestic heating. So basically, Hydrogen has been portrayed as the Swiss Army knife. It's the energy Swiss Army knife. It can do everything and anything you want it to do. <coughs> so, methanol production from steel production, yes, it would be perfect for it. Chemical feed stuff, yep, that's what we need. Light aviation, long haul aviation, rural trains, vintage trains, Bluebell Railway, <laughs> urban <laughs> delivery, hydrogen fuel cell cars, <coughs> uh, metro retropolitan. <coughs> Metropolitan trains and buses, off-road vehicles, it can do everything. And <coughs> it's kind of, it is like a Swiss Army knife, because a Swiss Army knife is a great tool. But it's usually not the best tool for the job. It's just a great tool that can do everything when you need one tool to do everything. But as engineers, we want to look at what's the most effective tool for the job. And it's not always hydrogen. And I think that... Um, 
As chair of Hydrogen Sussex, I'm not supposed to say that. As chair of Hydrogen Sussex, I'm supposed to walk in and say hydrogen perfect for everything. And I do upset some people in the hydrogen community by not saying that. And I have given presentations where they, the, the hydrogen organisations, have been scowling at me. Shut up, shut up, don't say this. And it's like, look, well, I'm just going to stick to the facts. I'm going to stick to the... To, I'm going to focus on what's the most efficient and effective tool for the job. So, which hydrogen cases, use cases, do we prioritise? That's the question for me. Where can we make the biggest thing impact? How can we most significantly assist the transition to net zero? And for me, that's what we need to prioritise. So, Michael Liebrich, who um, Michael Liebrich set up or founded um, what is now Bloomberg Energy Futures. So, Michael Liebrich really knows what he's talking about in terms of energy. And he um, drafted up, he dropped this clean hydrogen ladder, which focusing on the different competing technologies. He had some input from Adrian Hill, who's a really interesting um, energy analyst based in Brussels, and, and Paul Martin. But they were focusing on what use cases have no real alternative. I mean, this is based on your, cl your classic uh, energy rating that you get on your fridge, on your house, whatever. We all know these energy ratings. He's, he's looking at not at the most efficient, but what has what has competing technologies and what hasn't um, what um, is uncompetitive with too many competing technologies and what, what is unavoidable, which has no real alternative. So on the A the A row row A, uh, which is virtually unavoidable, we have fertilizer hydrogenation. Hydrocracking, hydrocracking, and desulfurisation, there are no real alternatives to using hydrogen. So we should focus on that. And then we have, um, I was actually talking about this, this slide with a, um, a safety en engineer, and <laughs> this slide really offended him because the no real alternatives are in red. And um, the, uh, the ones that are least likely to happen are in yellow, and he's like, no, it's round the wrong way, it's round the wrong way, that should be green going down to red. But, so, we've got the, the rows B, C and D, which are, or B and C predominantly, which have few competing technologies. So, uh, well, I did mention methanol, actually, which is really important. Methanol, shipping, off-road vehicles, chemical feedstocks, um, and then long haul aviation, remote trains, coastal river vessels, mixed <coughs> vehicles. And then there's some um, technologies that do have um, some other competing technologies, such as long term storage and local CO2 remediation. And then we come down here, and this is the, the most recent version of his um, the slide, because uh, he's been revising this ladder over the last few years. And basically, he's saying that things like Hydrogen fuel cell cars, metropolitan, uh, metropolitan, I can't pronounce that word tonight, Metropo metropolitan trains and buses, urban delivery, two and three wheels, bulk heat fuels, and power system balancing, that's less likely. So um, I think it's really important to remember what's, where is it a really appropriate tool and where is it going to have better, um, more efficient, more effective competitors. So, um, looking at transport, and there's been a lot of focus on hydrogen for transport. Um, so, transport became the UK's largest emitting sector of greenhouse emissions, greenhouse gas emissions in 2016. Uh, as we all know, uh, the, the <coughs> carbon density of um, carbon emissions from the electricity grid have plummeted um, over the last decade, and it's just been amazing to see. So, but the carbon emissions from transport have pretty much remained the same uh, over the last 30 years, actually. Um, there's been very little reduction there. Some Im improvements in efficiency, countered by increases in weight of vehicles, as more and more um, passenger cars or SUVs, and more and more vans on the road because everyone wants their Amazon delivery and the deliverer and so on, you know, so there's, there's more and more vehicles on the road. So um, transport's the largest emitting sector, and people have been looking at this, so there's this study that was done uh, probably about five years ago now, 
by um, the EU Fuel Cells and Hydrogen Joint Undertaking, which is the EU funded project. Um, and they said, what, what areas have, um, what areas of transport are more appropriate to battery electric vehicles and what areas are more appropriate to hydrogen? And they were like, they're obviously looking, as you can see, at um, the daily range that's required and the weight of the vehicles. And they were saying, right, okay, well, on the slide here, which I'll talk through because it's not very, very clear, but they were saying, right, okay, we think that for the smaller vehicles with the lower payloads, battery electric vehicles will be more appropriate, and for the larger vehicles, then fuel cell electric vehicles will be the more appropriate. Um, vehicles, and that includes mining, um, long haul freight, uh, vehicles with high payloads, etc. Fuel cell electric vehicles will be the more appropriate. Um, they've also got some interesting suggestions, and in the bottom down here it says medium and large car segments, and they're saying, you know, again, is it fuel cell electric vehicle or battery electric vehicle that's, that's more efficient? And they pretty much say, for everything apart from small cars for private use, that hydrogen fuel cell might be the more efficient vehicle. Uh, taxis, limousine ser services, hydrogen fuel cell. So, you know, th and this, is, this was a sensible report that was produced five years ago, but there's a, so much has changed in the last five years. So much has changed in battery electric cars in the last five years. So, so I showed this slide earlier, and I said, you know, hydrogen is a great com energy compact. <coughs> Carry, especially when you compare it to battery electric vehicles, which can only carry um, 50, uh, 50 watt hours um, per kilo. It's now about 300 to 300 watt hours per kilo. So, you know, it's increased by a factor of seven. And if you look at the energy efficiency comparison of hydrogen fuel cells versus battery electric vehicles, they're not comparable at all. So, this one study by Transport Environment said. Um, if you're looking at different technologies in a passenger car, uh, an EV, a battery EV, 73% efficient from, um, if you start off with 100, uh, 100 kilowatt hours of electricity on the, um, on the grid, you'll end up with 73 kilowatt hours of propulsion in your car. Comparing that with a conventional vehicle, it's only 13% efficient, and we kind of we do forget that we do forget how amazingly inefficient our petrol and diesel cars are that we use today. But a hydrogen fuel cell vehicle, if you start off with 100% renewable electricity, and you're using that to, for electrolysis to produce the hydrogen, <coughs> you'll only end up you'll end up with 52 kilowatt hours of hydrogen, and then you'll end up with um, only. 22 kilowatt hours of full propulsion, so it's incredibly inefficient. More efficient than a, pet than a petrol diesel vehicle, but only because they're a really inefficient process. So, um, oh, I keep doing that, excellent. So, a different study looked at the same thing and said fuel cell vehicle, 23% efficient, some of them, well, between 19 and 23% efficient, depending whether you're using compression or liquefaction, so depending whether you're using um, hydrogen at a 300 bar or a um, 700 bar, or um, if you've got an EV, 69% efficient. So it's so much more efficient, which means <coughs> you're going to be paying four, five, six times the price for your hydrogen than you will be to power you than you will for your battery EV. So why are taxis going to choose hydrogen rather than battery EV? I mean, it, ju it just doesn't make sense. So, um, and as I mentioned earlier, there's been a huge um, progression with um, batteries. So hydrogen could play an important role in decarbonising heavy duty transport, but batteries have massively re reduced in cost <coughs> and are still increasing in energy density. Um, so we've seen huge improvements, and we've, we've, we've regularly see battery EVs that, that can drive for um, 
300, you know, three, buying a car that can drive 300 miles, 300 mile range, that's, that's absolutely normal at the moment. You can, you can get ones that can drive up to 400 miles and it's going to change, you know, over the next few years we're going to get more and more car <coughs> battery EVs with longer ranges, if you need that. So, um, the Committee for Climate Change had a, did a study a few years ago looking at zero emission HGVs. Um, buses and coaches. And they found that there will be some increase, they projected some increase in fuel cell HGVs up to 2035. But then after that, batteries and coach, uh, battery EVs will just outcompete them. <coughs> so, you know, that's what, that's what the future is, is going to be batteries for, for or batteries, or actually pantographs as well. So we're going to, you know, the trolley bus style technology. So, so that's what we're going to see, that's the more efficient future. And what we have to be careful of actually, which I haven't included in this slide, is they said that if you go for early investment, you might be stuck with the Betamax equivalent, you might be stuck with a technology that then becomes outmoded. And that's what some people have found. So um, McKinsey produced this very bullish report uh, last year, and they predicted that there would be nearly a million hydrogen fuel cell HGVs on the road across the EU by 2035. Really, you know, really strong hydrogen believers, this is what we're going to see. However, what we're finding is that hydrogen trucks are unable to compete on, co on cost with fully electric and the rest of the decarbonised road frame. So, this is just from last year that. Um, Hydrogen powered heavy lorries, once seen as the future of emission transport, could soon be relegated to niche markets in Europe, overtaken by electric trucks. Um, and again, actually, I, I didn't include the slide, but um, there, was, there was an interesting map of the UK um, in a report that was produced by DEC, as it was at the time, so the Department of Energy and Climate Change, um, saying, predicting that we would have um, dozens, hundred hydrogen fuel refueling stations across the UK by now. We'd have so many. And in 2020, when a lot of these, there was a lot of momentum around hydrogen came at the time, we had 15 hydrogen refueling stations across the UK, and it was great. We've now got, I checked today, we've now got three, and two of those are currently out of action. <laughs> so there's there's one in Aberdeen that's working. Uh, I know someone with a hydrogen fuel cell car in Sussex, uh, and they've actually had to produce their own hydrogen and bought it themselves to recharge their car because there's nowhere to use it. I mean, there's no you can't. Uh, they can afford to do that. But, you know, it's expensive. It's a really expensive way of getting there. <coughs> and I just saw, actually, that... Um, so the one area where the um, hydrogen vehicles... Well, hydrogen vehicles have been um, popular in Korea and Japan, specifically Korea, especially Korea, actually, where there's been a whole, huge amount of momentum and a huge amount of support from the, the governments. And... Um, but outside of the Far East, the one place where the hydrogen vehicles have been popular has been California. And there's been a lot of investment in hydrogen um, in California, especially for road transport. The hydrogen that they're using there is grey hydrogen, so bigger, you know, more significant carbon emissions than the petrol or diesel vehicles that they're displacing. But <coughs> that aside, there's been a quite interesting uptake of hydrogen in California. And I just saw yesterday that Shell, who own a lot of hydrogen refueling stations across California, they're pulling out. So Shell, you know, who have access to cheap energy, they don't find it economically viable to keep going with their hydrogen refueling stations in, in California. So it's, I don't think hydrogen is the solution for transport. And hydrogen for domestic heating, as I mentioned earlier, that's been really, really heavily promoted in the UK. Um, don't know if you saw, there's been a lot of discussion around it uh, at the end of last year. So, um, 
This was a um, a comparison <coughs> that was um, produced by was produced by David uh, Professor David Sieben, who's a professor of mechanical engineering at um, Cambridge University, um, and he produced this for Letty, which is the London. Well, it was the London Energy Transformation Initiative. I think they've replaced London with another word that implies it's for the whole country now. But they're, they're a really interesting organisation, actually. Uh, they're looking at how we need to design our buildings to be ready for net zero. So they, was, they were looking at what we need to, um, to heat a home and how efficient that is. So looking at how we can heat a home, uh, a decarbonised home, and looking at the different options. So we could use, I'm just going to read through this because it's not hugely clear on the slide, but it's using blue hydrogen, uh, electricity made from natural gas, um, green hydrogen, or a heat pump um, from a green grid. And if you're using blue hydrogen, as I mentioned earlier, you've got, the, you've got losses from... Um, so blue hydrogen made from natural gas, you've got some losses in steam reformation, there's going to be some carbon emissions with that too. Um, there's losses around <coughs> storage, losses around transport, and a void is never 100% efficient. So you're going to end up, if you start off with 100 kilowatt hours, you're going to end up with about 58 kilowatt hours of heat. So 58% efficient, I reckon. So electricity from natural, well, yeah, actually I'll, I'll go on. Actually, so green hydrogen, You've got your 100% kilowatt hours from your offshore wind, in my diagram here. Uh, goes to the grid, electrolysis, um, storage and transport use. It's 46% efficient, so it's less efficient than the, than the blue hydrogen. You haven't got any carbon emissions, though. If you're heating your ha house with a heat pump um, from a green grid, this is not a particularly ambitious heat pump either. So it's a heat pump that they're saying with a COP a coefficient of performance of three, which is very easily achieved these days. You're going to end up with, if you start off with 100 kilowatt hours of electricity, you're going to end up with 270 kilowatt hours of heat. So obviously, that's a lot more efficient than the different hydrogen alternatives. And if you're heating your home with a heat pump, but the electricity is just generated from natural gas, um, you've still got, even with all the losses from the natural gas going through the um, CCTG, you've still got, um, you end up with 173 kilowatt hours of heat, so it's 173% <coughs> efficient. So you can just see from this how much more efficient heating a home with a heat pump is compared to using um, green hydrogen or blue hydrogen. And you can convey this another way, you can say, well, what, how much renewable capacity would we need to heat our homes, um, either with green hydrogen, which is the top, or with heat pumps, which is the, the bottom graph. So, if we're just heating our home with heat pumps, then we'll need 67 gigawatt, gigawatts um, installed capacity of offshore wind, which would have a size of 9,000 square kilometres. If we're heating our homes with green hydrogen, we need six times that amount. So we need 385 gigawatts of installed capacity, um, 52,000 square kilometres of offshore wind. So, so much more offshore wind will be required if we if we need to if we're heating our homes this way. Um, and then the Committee for Climate Change produced a report uh, last year, basically saying, long story short, they said, um, yeah, we were quite positive about hydrogen a few years ago, we thought about it a little bit more, we thought about the um, fugitive emissions um, from hydrogen production, especially around blue hydrogen. Um, government's going to make a decision, the government said that it's going to make a decision on um, heating homes with um, hydrogen uh, in 2026. But we think that the economic energy security and environmental case for using hydrogen for heating is much worse now than it, is in 20, than it was in 2020. So, you know, the subtext is we think it's a bad idea. 
Um, and um, Jan Rosenau, um, he wrote a meta re review last uh, de December, so a couple of months ago, looking at uh, 54 independent studies of um, decarbonising heating, and they all basically found that um, hydrogen would play, at best, play a niche role in heating, as it's less efficient and more expensive than its alternatives. Um, and the International Energy Agency, who were very, very bullish around hydrogen a few years ago, they uh, did a study last year, their latest uh, net zero roadmap, and they were looking at the hydrogen demand in 2050 in the building sector. And um, they said, oh, actually, yeah, we won't be using it, it'll be zero. So they're, they're a lot less positive around it than they were as well. Um, so what should we be focusing on? So at the moment, we're using um, just under 100 million tonnes a year of hydrogen. So in 2021, we used 94 million tonnes a year. And um, that's mainly actually in refining, um, so <coughs> oil refineries, um, in ammonia and methanol production and in some iron and steel production. And the global um, hydrogen production by technology <coughs> is the vast amount of that, so 80% of that is grey hydrogen. So it's fossil fuel, the hydrogen is derived from fossil fuel without any carbon capture. There's a tiny amount that's from carbon capture and then otherwise it's from a byproduct as well. So the low carbon hydrogen is less than 1% of total production at the moment. Um, I mentioned ammonia earlier, so ammonia is the biggest producer and user of hydrogen in Europe and it's responsible for over 50% of hydrogen usage. Um, synthetic nitrogen fertiliser production is responsible for around 10% of global agricultural emissions and 2% of global greenhouse gas emissions. And Iberdrola in Spain, they've actually um, they're building a 100 megawatt P um, PV plant and a 20 megawatt electrolyzer, which is, they built it, <coughs> um, which is going to be producing 3,000 tonnes a year of hydrogen. So they said, right, okay, we know what we're building, we know why we're building it. It's not just a, we're going to produce hydrogen and someone will come and buy it from us. They know that this is specifically for fertilizer production because, you know, they. they they need to be able to produce fertiliser and they need to be able to produce fertiliser without carbon emissions. So, so they've got a very clear use case for this. Um, iron and steel, which I mentioned earlier. So the iron and steel industry is responsible for about 4% of, of carbon emissions in Europe and 89% worldwide. And as I'm sure you're aware, the most scalable route to decarbonising steel <coughs> is through the direct reduction of iron and that uses hydrogen. So de different estimates vary, but they, there's different estimates saying that the decarbonising the steel industry would require between 50 and 100 million tonnes a year of hydrogen. So it's a fair bit of hydrogen that's required there. And I was just reading today actually about the H2 green steel, steel which is um, they, they're just building at the moment in Boden in northern S Sweden. So it's the world's first green hydrogen integrated steel mill. And you might think, I mean, that it's literally, it's a steel mill in the middle of nowhere, in the tundra, in, in, you know, in northern Sweden. Why are they building it there? And the answer is, the average day ahead, electricity prices, that's why they're building it there. There's no other reason. So in northern, so in northern Italy, your, um, what should read them? prices really clearly. Um, to produce, because um, the economics are going to be the same wherever, the, in terms of hydrogen production. You need uh, the same amount of energy, the same amount of electricity going through to produce your hydrogen. And if you produce your hydrogen in northern Italy, it's going to cost you um, £7.70 a kilo of hydrogen, which is 34 kilowatt hours. To produce your hydrogen in France, £5.80 a kilo. Northern Sweden, £1.80 kilo because the renewable electricity there is so cheap. So 
that's where we're going to see the big industry in the future of places where the renewable power is abundant and really, really cheap. So that's why we're going to see these shifts to steel production in completely random places around the world because that's where it's going to follow where the electricity is cheap. Um, other areas of hydrogen are um, aviation. So um, they're looking at replacing the fuel in UK planes, and we've done some calculations around this. And if you replace it with hydrogen, we're going to need more than double the amount of renewable capacity that we've got currently. So a colossal amount of gener um, electricity generation. Um, however, if you start looking at alternative fuels, that could rise to five times the amount. So, um, yeah, we're going to need a lot of power to, de to decarbonise aviation. <coughs> Um, and in the maritime sector, so looking at fuel cell ships. So fuel cells can be a really efficient way to use um, to use multiple fuels. So it doesn't have to just be hydrogen. And it means that um, that we can use smaller tanks for <coughs> the same work. And the, you know, one wonderful things about fuel cells is it's quiet, so no moving parts. Heat can be captured for reduced waste energy. Um, at the moment. There's low availability, so very few proven cases in the maritime environment. Um, very few examples of the sizes needed, at the sizes needed, and there's concerns around longevity as well, and the potential of the contamination of the cathodes that's in the fuel cell. So, looking at the different fuels that are available for the maritime sector, so there's hydrogen. So, um, this is a really useful. Um, graphic to convey the amount, the energy density of the different fuels as well. So hydrogen or fuels such as ammonia and hydrogen uh, carriers, so hydrogen and ammonia um, do require a greater volume to deliver the same energy than LNG um, or the current fuels that are used. Uh, there is little availability at the moment and there's some safety and environmental concerns. Some of the alternatives in the maritime sector are nuclear power. So the potential in the longer term to have ships built using small modular reactors. Uh, some are looking into that. They'd be fueled for life in the same way that submarines are fueled. Um, and that would be a completely different business model. <coughs> There's obviously existing concerns around nuclear power and waste. Um, and other alternatives which are going to be much more likely for short uh, for short journeys are batteries, but you can see the difference in the volume that's required, the storage space that's required for batteries compared to hydrogen. So enormous volume required, which impacts the feasibility for swapping batteries, and enormous charging capacity that's needed for viable turnaround times. Um, I mentioned earlier decarbonising electricity, and I think this is a really important area for hydrogen. So. Uh, the Committee for Climate Change, they, they produced a report about this time last year on the future electricity demand. So, as we all know, Great Britain is aiming to fully decarbonise its electricity system by 2035. As we decarbonise, we expect higher demands for power, for transport, for heating buildings and in the industry. So we're expecting a 50% increase in electricity demand by 2035 and 100% or more by 2050. And obviously, by 2035, the vast majority of the annual generation will come from variable renewables. So about 70% from variable renewables, about 20% from an inflexible <coughs> supply, so nuclear, possibly bioenergy with CCS. So 10% is going to be from low carbon flexible solutions. And we'll need to plug the gap between demand and supply during periods of low <coughs> wind. There's that German term, isn't there? long periods, extensive periods of, of low wind and they're having to model everything around having up to a month with, that, with very little wind. So, and the solutions are basically going to be low carbon dispatchable plants, so it's either hydrogen turbines or gas with carbon capture and storage. So the UK will need a portfolio of low carbon flexibility and they're looking at what have we got that can last, you know, what can provide us this flexibility over um, different uh, lengths, so over minutes or hours or days or weeks or seasons. So batteries are great for 
providing flexibility over minutes or hours. Then we've got pump storage for a slightly longer up to days, compressed air, liquid air, smart response. But the only thing that can provide <coughs> flexibility over weeks or over seasons is either well, unabated gas, but we're not going to use that. So gas with um, carbon capture and storage or hydrogen. And then we've got here, on the bottom line, we've got electrolysis because the electrolysis could provide us if we have a surface of electricity production, then we've got that flexibility that's built in, which we can then use um, for um, dispatching the power for hydrogen. So the predicted demand for hydrogen by 2035, the Committee for Climate Change, they said we're going to see a consistent demand for hydrogen from some sectors, so industry, shipping, um, CHP power, and then it's going to provide low carbon dispatchable power. So they see that it will play an essential role Hydrogen will play an essential role in achieving the 2035 goal of a reliable and resilient decarbonised power system. And there was another interesting report that came out in October last year, which was by the UK National Infrastructure Assessment. Um, so it's the second National Infrastructure um, report that came out, and they they were really clear. They didn't beat back the bush. They they said. There's no public policy case for hydrogen to be used to heat individual buildings. You know, you can't get much clearer than that. But they did say hydrogen is key for reliant zero carbon electricity generation and that decarbonising industry would require switching from fossil fuels to a mix of electricity, hydrogen and fossil fuels are basic with carbon capture and storage. So they also concluded that what we'll need is a core network of infrastructure to transmit and store hydrogen and carbon. So that's going to be essential by 2035. And they call for a core hydrogen pipeline network, which will connect Grangemouth in North East Scotland, Teesside, Humberside, Merseyside and South Wales. Um, kind of circuits round London, going down to Southampton, across to South Wales. <coughs> Some um, hydrogen coming in from Redway, but you can see that there's a huge gap around here. So there's, you know, they're not foreseeing the hydrogen core networks go anywhere near the southeast. So hydrogen projects across Sussex, what have we got? We're not, you know, we're never going to be, we're never going to have this, the, the density of projects that they've got in the industrial Midlands or in, in the northeast. But what have we got in the southeast? We've actually got a really interesting concentration of projects across, um, particularly across West Sussex, um, there's a lot of interesting engineering projects, uh, engineering organisations there. So, uh, Ricardo, Ricardo built state-of-the-art test and development centre for hydrogen propulsion technologies in, in Shoreham, and then there's a lot of actually other engineering companies that are kind of offshoots from Ricardo, so Sarah's, Sarah's Power, so they're a leading developer in high, high efficiency <coughs> solid oxide fuel cell Technologies Bramble, the fuel cell technology disruptor. Um, H2 Green, the developing hydrogen production plant located in Shore Port. And um, Metrobus have just started operating, well, we started last June, uh, 20 hydrogen fuel cell single deck buses in Crawley, though they are actually having trouble um, obtaining that hydrogen at the moment. And um, uh, which I can go into later. And the University of Brighton, I probably should have mentioned Sussex here as well, um, but Daddy might, might like it if I just focus on Brighton. So Brighton's worked with a number of um, companies in the region to develop their innovations. Um, so I'm not going to go into this in depth, but this, so it's interesting the profile that we've got in Sussex. So basically, we don't have a huge amount of industry. We're never going to be able to compete with the northeast, the northwest, with uh, the in industrial Midlands, so we're just all the vast amounts of renewable power that's in Scotland. But we've got engineering expertise actually in Sussex, and it really um, there's a huge amount of projects going on. We um, we do very very well in the national um, decarbonisation competition. So I'm funded by Desnos department for transport. So there's a lot going on. So um, engineering sector has got more room to expand, opportunities for collaborative working, and there's a lot of highly educated stakeholders, lots of them in the room, are seeking to learn from one another. And there's lots of practical, transferable practical skills as well. So if you work with natural gas, you can work with hydrogen. 
she can work with renewables, she can work with hydrogen, you know, there's lots and lots of transferable skills around that as well. So I mentioned little heavy industry, but there's lots of hydrogen technical engineering expertise and good research institutions <coughs> in there. And there's also key infrastructure, and I haven't mentioned them because they do do their own thing, but there's a lot of key infrastructure in Gatwick. Who would, you know, if Gatwick go to start to shift to hydrogen, they're going to start using vast amounts of hydrogen. Um, so yeah, it's, it's an interesting situation in Sussex. Um, so the, the key question is, will we have enough domestic green hydrogen? And the Climate Change Committee, they said hydrogen is needed for power. It's going to be essential for power, but we should challenge the idea that there will be lots of hydrogen available for other sectors. So, I think in conclusion, I, I'd say that hydrogen is vital for the transition to net zero, but we have to remember it's expensive, it's efficient, inefficient, can be logistically tra um, challenging, trans transporting a large volume or heavily compressed gas. Um, it's got a high global warming potential, which is 11 times that of CO2. It's more explosive, which I haven't mentioned, but I can do. Um, so, you know, there are challenges to it, and we, we shouldn't deny that, uh, especially when people are talking about hydrogen and domestic properties. That was madness, but uh, let's not go there. So, um, I do think it's going to be key for achieving net zero, but not everything, everywhere, all at once. <laughs> generating 
where we've got certain receptive electricity production. Yeah, because something about wind farms is they effectively generate a DC. Yeah. So you're cutting out the inverter, you can just immediately electrolyze it straight to the hydrogen. Yeah. Yeah. Which so you're cutting out some of the some of the losses there. Some of the losses yeah. there. Yeah. But it is an inefficient process. So when right. you when you're generating a hydrogen, there's a, there's a lot of losses, and then when you're um, then when you're firing hydrogen to produce electricity, there are further losses. They are they are saying as well that it's, it's going to be more efficient to actually connect uh, new nuclear power stations to um, electrolyzers because you can you can have greater efficiencies there. Okay. okay. Right. Uh, following on yeah. from the last question, um, why don't uh, hydrogen Sussex? Why why isn't there a, a power station, hydrogen fired power station in uh, Shoreham, or, or for example? And if I could just follow yeah. on for a minute, the thing is that uh, firing, uh, getting a, a power station going, is actually takes a long time. So if you've got peak loads, there's another good reason for, for having it, even though you're, you, you said that uh, there isn't a surplus of wind energy, it would still be worthwhile um, actually using it for, for peak um, flattening. Yes, yeah, so, um, <coughs> so the planning, so HG Green are planning a hydrogen production facility uh, electrolyzer at Shawnport and they have been in discussions with um, I think it's uh, SSE who run the um, Shawn power station about potentially supplying the power station with some hydrogen and it's whether there's a business case around that um, but at, at the moment it, 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 it's all um, It, it, depend, it depends on the government's support around whether there can be a business case to, to convince um, SSE to go, yes, OK, we will start taking in hydrogen. I think that the trouble with um, the thing about hydrogen is there was this huge hype around hydrogen in 2020. And I didn't get a chance to, to include this in my slides. But um, so in 2020, the uh, International Energy Agency was saying, yep, we're going to need vast amounts of hydrogen globally by 2050. And they've downgraded those projections. So they're now saying we're going to need, I think, globally we're going to need 40 million, 400 million tonnes of hydrogen a year by 2050. But a couple of years ago, three, two or three years ago, they were saying we're going to need loads more. So if you look at um, the hydrogen map, there's... Um, I think 1,200 hydrogen projects planned across the world. But they're kind of like all the renewable projects that are planned, that we know there's vast numbers of renewable projects planned across the UK. There's 1,200 um, hydrogen projects planned across the world, but there's not that many projects that have been funded and not that many projects that have actually started. So, I mean, there's a really, really significant drop. So I think it's... I think we... Um, that we've been focusing on kind of like, yes, we'll, we'll build a hydrogen production facility and then we'll find the off-takers. But it actually works better the other way around, which is what we've seen in northern Sweden where they said, OK, look, we need to build steel. Where's the most effective, where's the most efficient, where's the cheapest place to build steel? We'll build it where we've got surplus electricity. And then we'll work backwards from that. Okay. So we're going to have the electrolysis plant there where we've got the off-takers in the same way as Iberdrola in Spain, they're building the electro electrolyzer where they're going to be using the hydrogen to produce um, ammonia, to produce um, fertilizer. But it doesn't make sense to um, port hydrogen, uh, you know, distances in... Uh, no, sure. It, it, sure. It, it really doesn't make well, sense. Well, it doesn't, but then, I mean, 10% of global shipping is, is porting... Um, Energy around the world. <coughs> okay. Porting oil and gas around the world. Yep. Can I have a different question? Mm -hmm. And th that is, it, in your case for um, against hydrogen cars, there was one factor which you did not consider, and that is 
that a, a hydrogen car would be a lot lighter than a battery, an, a, an EV. And in fact, there's, there's some people who say that the biggest pollutant of an EV is actually the tyre wear causing part particulate um, carbon from that. So if you're looking at it from the point of view of pollution, then the hydrogen car or vehicle, whatever, should be far, far better because of the weight difference. There will be a weight difference, but you have to remember that um, you're going to need a fair bit of weight for the tanks to store the hydrogen at high pressure. So I think the Toyota uh, Mirai tanks, this, I think, because they store hydrogen at 700 bar, um, and that's 87 kilos of tank weight in itself. That's a lot. Which is quite a lot. Yeah. Um, it <coughs> tends, I was thinking about this just today actually, because um, I used to be in a former life, I was head of sustainability at the University of Brighton, and I was uh, working with them while um, the university senior management decided in their wisdom to build a giant um, multi story car park that then wasn't ever used because people didn't work from home. But, um, <laughs> They chose some quite interesting consultants to assist, put car park experts to assist them with this, and they were very pro-driving, not surprisingly, because they were car park engineers, and they were <laughs> quite anti-EVs. And they just were talking about the emissions from increased tyre wear from EVs. But actually, <coughs> most EVs only need to replace their tyres around every 50,000 miles, so it's... I don't think you do get increased emission from tyre particles. I think that's one of the scare stories around EVs. Okay. Um, because they don't break so much. How about increased road wear? Because that's yes, going to no, make no, car parts. No, I think... <laughs> then I mean, I think, wears out yeah. the road in the car park. But, then, but we're seeing that with, with vehicles getting heavier. Right. In the round any, anyway, whether it's in terms of combustion energy. But we are going to slight, slightly off topic, so... Yes. David? Yeah. Yeah. Simple question. Uh, the Swedish steel mill got all that electricity. Why don't they just use electricity? Why generate hydrogen? Because for Swedish, for the direct reduction of iron, you need hydrogen. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So um, it, it's replacing coking coal. So you remember the, uh, the government, in their wisdom, decided to give the go ahead to. The, um, the new coal mine in Cumbria to produce coke and coal and they said oh we need coke and coal it's not for um, electricity generation we're going to need it for steel manufacture but that's kind of the 19th century way of producing steel and the, the future of producing steel is going to be with direct reduction of iron and the most the the way that's been proven at scale to reduce iron is with um, hydrogen there are other there are other te technologies to do so, but they haven't been proven scale. David? On the subject of transportation, um, I seem to remember reading quite some time ago, oh, we all know that hydrogen is the lightest element, more difficult to contain. Um, I remember reading some time ago of 20% uh, hydrogen being put into the national gas network, and at some distance, and I can't remember what it was, they couldn't detect any. Uh, I, I don't know the, the truth behind that, but uh, how difficult is, is transportation? Um, let me just see if I've got the slide. Oh, gas was 30 percent hydrogen. Um, no, I didn't. Didn't yeah, I mean, hydrogen is incredibly leaky. There we go. Let's see if I can show you this. Oh, you can see it, it's not, it's on the hidden, but you can see it anyway. So hydrogen is incredibly leaky, um, which is one of the reasons why the proposals to, economics <coughs> aside, one of the reasons why the proposals to um, use hydrogen for domestic heating was a terrible idea. Because basically the gas networks are saying, we'll use hydrogen, it'll be fine, we'll have a business, we'll still have a business, you know, because if, if we don't use um, hydrogen for domestic heating, the gas networks have lose half their customers. That's a given. So um, they're saying we'll have hydrogen in, in the 
um, domestic grid, that'd be fine. Uh, it, we can still use all our existing pipework. We, that's why they're carrying out all these, um, you know, southern gas networks and the like of doing. Oh, we're we're improving our grid. They're, they're improving their grid so that they can basically have the grid purpose built for hydrogen. So that's why they're putting um, uh, polyethylene um, pipes in um, to stop hydrogen leaking through those, mm -hmm. and then they're saying, yeah, it'd be fine, once it's past the meter in the domestic property, it'd be fine, they can use the existing pipe like I wouldn't use, old pipe work for hydrogen. I mean, when, when I use hydrogen, I'll, I'll show you the slide again, when we use hydrogen in the project that I've been working on, all of the pipe work is stainless steel, it's leak tested with hydrogen, it's leak tested with nitrogen first of all, at pressure, and then leak tested with hydrogen, and you always get leaks, and then we have um, three layers of hydrogen sensing. So we have uh, hydrogen sensors, we have uh, ultrasound sensor that can detect any uh, just a difference to the background level movement, and we have flame detectors because hydrogen flames can be invisible, which adds to the fun. I did. I read something yesterday <laughs> about someone who was working. Uh, an engineer was working, I think, at some refinery where they had hydrogen oil, they have um, hydrogen oil, oil refineries. And they were told, they were instructed, you have to be really, really careful. The walkways have to be designed so that you don't go anywhere near hydrogen pipes. Because you can get hydrogen leaks, and you can get hydrogen flames, and they can be invisible. And the most, <laughs> the safest thing to do, this literally was in the safety guide, is walk round with some paper in front of you, that's what the advice said. What with a flame on the end of it? Well, if you walk into a flame, that will catch fire. The idea. paper will catch fire, you'll see it. <laughs> Go away. <laughs> rather than just you right. walking and you'll feel it. So that's, well, that's a better thing to do. So, um, the government's actually given the, just given the head, uh, go ahead last month, uh, no, back in December, to start blending a little bit, up to 20% of hydrogen in the gas grid. Now, I don't know whether it will all leak out, but the gas networks have been very, very proactive in saying, yeah, 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 blend, blend hydrogen in the gas grid. It will be, and the government said, that will be a useful business case so that we can encourage the production of hydrogen without any... If you don't have off-takers, we'll just stick it in the grid and we'll, we'll pay you for it. I mean, it's really, really, really... The economics don't make sense at all. The physics doesn't either. No, the physics doesn't either. And the thing to remember is this, this is going to be used as a form of greenwashing by the gas companies to say, look, we'll put hydrogen in the gas grid, we're green in the gas grid, and we'll put 20% hydrogen in the gas grid, and hydrogen zero carbon, except it's not always, but, you know, we're green in the gas grid. But if you put 20% of hydrogen in the gas grid, you're going to re reduce your carbon emissions by 7 or 8 percent. And that's not even taking that into account the fugitive emissions either when, that you'll lose along the way, because hydrogen delivers less, um, less power per unit volume, so it, it has a lower, um, you know, it's only 33 well, it's 33 kilowatt hours per kilo, but it's less power per unit volume than natural gas. We need three times or as much of it per site, per volume, than, than natural gas. So, um, yeah, it's not going to be the same. So, do we have any other questions? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I was going to say, going back to the, the chart you had about seasons yeah. even being used, uh, like hydrogen being used for seasons of energy cover, like even at the start of the Ukraine war, it turned out we offloaded a huge amount of natural gas storage and as a country we were like, oh no, we've actually got like, you know, 10% yeah. or 15% of what Germany Oops. yes. How, like that upheaval to not only store seasons worth of uh, gas, but hydrogen as well, like, how, how do we address that delta from where we are to where we have to get to? That's a really good question. I can't. So I suddenly, for the life of me, I can't remember the name of the store that we had off um, in the North Sea. Right. Roth. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Because and I used to know this because I used to, uh, along with colleagues at Sussex and Bournemouth and Portsmouth University, we used to buy our gas together. And when they, when the government said, yeah, yeah, it's fine, we don't what, we need to worry about the rough storage and the prices. You know, you, mm -hmm. it's you're more exposed to a volatile market because you can't store it when the prices are cheap. 
Um, so yes, we do. Um, we are going to need colossal amounts of storage of hydrogen, and, and that's you know, and then that gets challenging in terms of the economics because it's just generating it to store it to hope that we'll need it when we really decarbonise. I mean. I, I think we're going to achieve, uh, we can achieve an 80, 80 to 90 percent, you're the expert, not me, but we can achieve an 80 to 90 percent decarbonised grid very easily, well not very easily, but it's that last 20 percent that's going to be more challenging. And it's, I think it's going to be really, I don't know whether you've had any presentations on this, but it's really interesting that Labour is saying that they're going to deliver a decarbonised grid by 2030. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's just... <laughs> 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 but, but they may de 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 yeah no sure but they may deliver a, a they may just up the rate of change sure. so um, yeah but I think it is going to be challenging yes absolutely so. during those dim and distant times of the past when we had lockdown there was lots of IT lectures online and there was a chap who was there to chemists talking about future of aviation Ammonia, and he was talking about, like you just mentioned, hydrogen having quite a low uh, power density. Yeah. Um, ammonia's got much higher power density. Yeah. It works brilliantly in fuel cells. You can have it in solid form or liquid form. So he was talking about for aircraft fuel and aim to decarbonise. And it sounded really broad, but I thought the guy was off his rocket, but he was absolutely really impressive. And I noticed you mentioned ammonia, but more for sort of agro agriculture. And maritime sector, and yeah. and yes, for for aviation as well. As he was saying, although you might think ammonia is quite hazardous, actually paraffin, kerosene is really nasty in this field. So if we just took away that issue, because ammonia apparently when it when it does burst, it's just a powder on the ground and vacuum it up. But I don't see I see people doing hydrogen batteries. I don't hear ammonia so much. Yeah, I, don't I know mean, what your view was of that. I think I kind of. I guess I glossed over it a little bit because it's going to be, if we use ammonia, it's going to be derived from hydrogen, so it's going to be a hydrogen-derived fuel, so we'll still need the hydrogen produced to produce the ammonia. Um, and there's there's other um, there's some, there's another e-fuel that will use hydrogen, which has which is even more dense, which they're talking about, which would be more applicable for the aviation sector as well. Mike, go for it. A comment and a question. Yep. Comment on the steel industry. We, we had a talk from a steel expert a few months ago, no, not here, but in another place. And I seem to remember he said, yes, you need hydrogen for soaking things, which is where you reheat billets and so on for rolling. Whereas electric arc things is, yeah, steel for and scrap and so on. Yep. That's a comment. Question, uh, half covered it long here, back to ammonia. And a much earlier question we had talking about uh, cars and the weight of the hydrogen. But if it was an ammonia engine, surely that's that's a good way of using hydrogen, and you've, you've got a lighter car again. Yeah, I think what you need to remember is the efficiencies. So, and, and whether you're whether you're talking about uh, a fuel cell running off ammonia or internal combustion <coughs> engine as well. But um, I just think that. Um, so, well, the, th the thing about hydrogen refueling stations is that you need a hydrogen refueling station to be able to refuel your hydrogen vehicle. And you need enough hydrogen vehicles around to justify the economics of a hydrogen refueling station. And they're, they're, quite, they're expensive to operate. Um, they constantly have maintenance issues, which so there was a hydrogen refueling station at Gatwick. It wasn't, uh, its capacity was very low, so it, it didn't have enough hydrogen there to refuel one box, hydrogen refuel to one box. <laughs> <laughs> and it kept, but its usage was so low that it kept from, the equipment kept from seizing up, so it, you know, it kept from breaking down all the time. So. So you've got this novel technology, novel this technology, which is trying to become mainstream. And you've got this competitor, battery electric vehicles, which is already 
16% of new cars are battery electric vehicles. So that's already mainstream. We've got less than 10, well, we've got three or four according to the website I saw today, um, hydrogen refueling stations across the UK. We've got just under 9,000 petrol or diesel petrol stations across the UK. And we've got 32,000 EV rechargeable points across the UK. So I can't see how small scale for passenger cars, they're ever going to compete, whether it's ammonia or anything else. And, and, and then you have to remember that if you're producing a fuel from electricity, it's going to be more expensive than the electricity. It's always going to be more expensive than the electricity. So it's never going to produce, compete on a cost basis with a battery electric vehicle. Yeah, in terms of it can recharge time might, might be an issue. Yeah, but you can get you can. I can fill my car with petrol in five minutes. Yeah, and I take eight can, hours to fill it up with electricity. You can you can fill a Hyundai Ionic Five or a Polestar in fifteen minutes. Yeah, if I drive it up to Scotland. No, but you can you can do that at a, a fast charger. At, uh, Peace Cottage, you can fill it up. So, so I mean that, okay. and that's literally now you can do that. That's not the technology next year okay, or a year later that. or a year later. Oh, my, my comment is, uh, should we not be thinking about trolley buses? No energy stores. Yeah. No pollution. We had them. We had them in the fifties. Yeah, no, we absolutely. Got rid of them. Absolutely. <laughs> we do, we need trams. We need trolley. But I mean, trams especially we need because. Trams are visible, you know, because I mean, we don't also, we don't need to assume that if I've got a car now, I've got to have a, you know, some sort of decarbonised vehicle car in the future. We actually need to shift away from individual car ownership, but that is. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Do we have another question? Yeah.